Hello, screenwriters. This is Writing for Screens. I am Glenn Gers, the person behind <laughs> Writing for Screens, which is a channel devoted to giving you tips and tools and skills and insights into the art and craft and sometimes business of screen writing, writing for TV screens, writing for web screens, writing for phone screens, writing for video screens, whatever kind of screens you want to write for. I hope that these uh, ideas that I gained in a 25 year career writing for TV and movies, um, uh, putting them into a bunch of lessons, uh, which I have here on. This is a screen grab of the channel main page. If you scroll down there, you'll see those uh, playlists. Got three playlists. I'll show you a close up. These three playlists, the first three that you will run into as you scroll, are screenwriting essentials, screenwriting tools, skills, and craft, and the process being a writer. These three are. Um, 10 minute videos that I have worked to try and give you as many practical, simple, thought provoking, possible tools or skills or ideas, ways to look at things that I gained, uh, had to figure them out for myself. Uh, they are valuable to me. They helped me make a career, but they may or may not be useful to you because every writer has to figure out and choose their own path. You have your own goals, you have your own style, you have your own world that you're coming from and world that you're trying to get into. And those things are yours alone. That specific combination, only you. So therefore you have to decide what works and what doesn't. Don't let anyone tell you that there's only one way to do things or there's a right way to do things or there is a way that will get you into the big game. All of that is not true. What's true is everyone has to figure out their own way. What I'm doing is trying to give you some tricks that I found. Maybe they're useful, maybe they're not. If not, cool, now you know what not to do. All of that is good. The main thing is these 10 minute lessons, that's where all the good stuff is. Then every Wednesday at 1 p.m., just like right now, I come on live to talk about something that's on my mind and answer questions. And thus you have the big picture of what we're doing here. Today's particular lesson is going to be about doing the thing, which I will talk about more. First, I'm going to do some hellos because I got a bunch of people to say hello to. Hello, Nathan. Good to see you. And Darian and Donna and Sonia. Hi. Hi. So, oops, I'm, I'm having a problem clicking. <laughs> hello, Larry and John. Hello, John. Um, I don't know that I've seen you before. If I have, I haven't seen that uh, icon. Hello, Jairo and Helene and Ricky. Gosh, a lot of a lot of regulars are back. Nice shirt. Yeah, this shirt is on its way out. It is at least 25 years old and it's it's starting to fray and fade. Uh, but I do like it because it makes me a walking green screen. Okay, hello, Clyde. <laughs> hello, Clyde. Yes, yes, you got to do the thing um, and not right. It's not about doing it right. Hello, LRET. So let's get into this quickly because it's just a little rant I want to give you and then I'm open to talk about whatever you guys want. But a bunch of things sort of coalesced this week for me when I was I was reading a book called Pandora's Box by Peter Biskind. Peter Biskind wrote one of the great, most entertaining, gossipy histories of filmmakers of the 1970s called Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. It's really fun, uh, worth reading. Um, and then he did a follow up on the indie film world of the 90s. Um, focusing on Sundance and Miramax called, I believe, Down and Dirty Pictures. Um, this book is about the, quote, new golden age of television or, or small screen or whatever you want to call the streaming television world that has existed since the late 1990s, um, Pandora's Box. But um, there was a, a quote, there was a line. Oh, hello. I have to say so. hello to uh, the gonotic genome. Or the, sorry, <laughs> the Gnostic Gnome. Hi, welcome. Um, good to see you. Welcome. So, Pandora's Box, Peter Biscuit. There was a section, um, I'm still early into the book, so I don't want to say uh, a review of the book because I haven't read the whole thing. Um, he's a very enjoyable writer. The gossip is great. It's just really good gossip. Um, and, and just a good picture of, of sections of filmmaking history. Um, but 
There was a section about HBO, which um, famously began the Golden Age, although there's a really good argument to be made in a, a book by James Ponzoiek, I believe his name is, um, uh, called the, Re the Revolution Will Be Televised, which puts the, the revolution much earlier in the 1980s with Stephen Bochco and, um, and some other really great network uh, people. But the point is, you're talking about HBO. And after The Sopranos at HBO, they went through a little bit of, a, of turmoil for various reasons. Um, they replaced a lot of executives um, because after The Sopranos, when they had sort of broken through to this concept of high quality original programming, um, the question was, what are you going to do next? Sopranos has been your thing. Um, and so... Um, this guy named Richard Plepler was hired among the new executives. He was made head of programming um, because the former head of programming had been arrested in Las Vegas for strangling his girlfriend. Um, anyway, Plepler, who, who did a good job, but at the time that he was, um, he, he, he got us through the, the game. He got us through till recently. I think he just left um, if he did. Anyway, the point is, he had never worked in programming before. He had been in other departments, and people were like, eh, I don't know if that's going to work. And there was a quote which, which shook me to my core um, from another executive um, about Plepler. He had a keen understanding of how original programming in particular was critical to the HBO brand and how it could be deployed to support that brand. Okay, so this quote really blew my mind because it's very, it's, there's nothing wrong with it, it's not wrong. Um, what's interesting is the way that people running the business look at the business, which is they are trying to uh, promote and support the brand, the HBO brand, which is, of course, that it's their job. I'm not saying it's wrong, but when you think about making stuff, this is a company that makes stuff, puts on shows for you, you don't think, ah, their job is to support their brand so as to make more money for that brand, and that frankly, if supporting that brand mean, meant turning it into the QVC, they would do that. Um, it, it shook me to my core, because when I go it went into the world of, of the arts, I thought, we're in the business of making art, <laughs> making and distributing art. Not the, or even entertainment. I'm, you know, not I'm art and entertainment. One thing, as far as I'm concerned, the point is <laughs> that that's not what the executives see the business as. They see it as critical to the brand and how it could be deployed. Programming is deployed to support the brand, which is accurate but disturbing. Uh, along those lines. There was, in the same day, a, an article in the New York Times by a gentleman named Tim Wu, who's a good writer about uh, business, talking about the merger of JetBlue, uh, an airline. And he, he was pointing out that JetBlue, when it started, was profitable, but, quote, not profitable enough. In 2014, Wall Street analyst turned on JetBlue and its chief executive at the time, Mr. Barger, accusing the company of being too consumer-focused. Investors demanded more fees and the cutting of less profitable routes. Unfortunately for customers, Wall Street won, Bar Mr. Barger was thrown out, and JetBlue started charging fees for all sorts of things. Um, that same day in the New York Times, there was a headline for an article. I did not read it, but I saw why doctors and pharmacists are in revolt. Once accustomed to a status outside the usual management labor hierarchy, many health professionals now feel as put upon as any clock-punching worker. Um, and I do not mean to say this to, to suggest that people should be elite and better than the average worker. What I'm saying is that this is all part of a picture in which the demands of business, the values of business, have taken on essentially a philosophical centrality to our lives, um, which is extremely disturbing to me. Um, although I, you know, I benefit from it and I have done well in the entertainment business, but I'm I'm troubled by the way, and I don't think this is new, 
but I think it has been building and growing, especially since the 1980s, um, into a, a religion, a philosophy, a faith. Um, the point is that that share price, investor return, is now the point of companies. Um, and and therefore, all, all of our life, we, we all tend to see things in terms of, will it make money? Will it be profitable? Will it be number one? Because one of the other things Pandora's box, the book about H, well, it's about streaming in general, but it mentions that HBO was vulnerable at the time that all this turmoil was taking place in the executive suite to being taken over by other companies. And if their profits went down, they would be able to be taken over. So this is an existential threat. So I'm not saying that this is nothing. I'm not saying that there is not a, a, a an a, environment of business competition, which I recognize is real. But I think it's important that we start to call attention to the, to the fact that profitability or success in a business form is not necessarily the point of what we are doing, is not necessarily the goal, the 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 reason, the, the motive, the way in which things should be judged. The, that business um, or profit or success in monetary um, uh, terms cannot be, should not be, as far as I'm concerned, presently is the way in which people are, people and things, activities are judged. This is important to writers because especially in the writing business, the publishing business, the movie business, the TV business, uh, the content, and it is now just called content, um, and, and you know what, it is content, so cool. I'm not actually like that offended by that. But the problem is that the content has lost <laughs> its central value um, in doing the thing, okay? So for instance, a hospital, they're talking about doctors, okay? Why doctors and pharmacists are in revolt? Um, because um, businesses are, are mostly in charge, of, certainly in America, and I do have to say this, um, are, are in charge of our healthcare system. And so therefore, a doctor is judged by how many patients they turn over and whether or not they are doing more profitable work compared to less profitable work. You don't run a hospital to profit. I mean, obviously, it is now set up in America that you do. But the point, doing the thing, the thing that a doctor does is take care of people's health, healing, ideally. If you have a tea shop, if you open a tea shop, you do not open the tea shop in order to make the biggest T universe, <laughs> like like the MCU, you don't have the T universe. How many other products can I spin off or make a department store around the T shops to say, ah, we could also sell sweaters. And well, people are sitting in chairs, so let's make a brand of chairs that goes with our T shop. Um, that that may happen, but that's actually bad for the business of the T shop making the tea for people to drink. The point of doing the thing of a tea shop is to make a tea shop, to make tea for people who drink tea. Um, very, very often, and this is this is not just an anti-capitalist rant, because very often we now have companies and individuals who believe that the point of everything we do is to make the world better um, or, or steer people in better ways. Um, the, the left and the right both are guilty of this idea of taking a thing that you do and turning it to another goal. Like if you have a school or a tea shop or a t-shirt company, it also has to help the environment or, or, or change the political system. This is, to my mind, a danger to artists because it is very difficult to do art if you are focused on this other set of goals and values. I am absolutely not saying you should ignore the fact that there is a business, that there is a, you, you, you have a reality of trying to compete for eyeballs and everything else. Um, I do, however, want to bring up this topic um, because almost everything that people ask me in terms of career or business is geared towards how do I essentially betray my work in order to sell? 
Um, and, and I cannot stress enough that I think that while you do have to understand the market, you do have to understand the mechanics of, of making money or doing business, the point is to do the thing, to make the tea shop. Do the thing. Okay, if you are a doctor, you should be healing. You should not be trying to give the company a bigger wedge to buy out other hospitals. Okay, that is not the point. It is really important, I believe, that at least we bring into our conversation, into our view of ourselves, this concept that we do the thing in order to get the thing done. We do the writing or the making of tea or the making of t-shirts or whatever it is in order to provide t-shirts to people who want t-shirts. Not to try and get everyone else out of the t-shirt business so that you have owned the t-shirt space and you can therefore then take over hotels. The point is to make the t-shirt. Ideally, that should be a way to make a living. It won't always be, okay? You may have to have your tea shop that is in fact supported by you know, your side business selling drugs out the back door. I don't know. I do know that you can't always be profitable doing the thing. Profit is a, an aggressive competitive deal. And um, I think it would be helpful if, honest to God, <laughs> we managed to look at doing the thing as the center, there would be fewer fears of takeovers. In other words, no one in the insurance business would be trying to buy out HBO <laughs> if HBO's profits felt, uh, fell a little bit. And then it would just be a question of can HBO make it against Netflix or will so many people watch the other thing that they just have to close their doors? That's all, I think, legit. Um, but I do worry about the fact that nobody's even questioning anymore the idea that um, if you are not doing the best business, you are in fact somehow wrong, evil, failed, um, uh, or frankly just vulnerable. You are going to be taken over, run over, controlled by the ones who have taken the bigger slice of the business. So this said, I know I've brought up a lot of, of things that have, I am sure going to uh, raise a lot of questions and we can talk about it. I'm happy to tell you my opinions um, and they are just my opinions. I just want to raise the issue because it really bothers me that, that the talk is not of doing the thing um, in general. Be, and I believe the way that the world changed, although powerful people obviously have the ability to, to make initiatives or, or make changes, the main way that things happen in this world is that there is simply a, a, a an agreed upon um, consensus of behavior that that killing someone. It's not so much that you're afraid of going to jail. It's that you just don't think it's the right thing to do. You decide not to do it. Likewise, spitting on the somebody else's shoes. If you're sitting in the subway, you, you hopefully Although there are signs that say no spitting, I believe the real reason that most people don't do that much spitting on the subway eh, is it's, it's uncomfortable because we have agreed not to spit on each other. And, and that's really my point is simply I'm trying to raise the point so that in our discussions of these things, we keep in mind doing the thing, whether it's t-shirts or tea shops or writing a script, um, is in fact the central point. Running HBO should indeed be about the HBO brand, but as we have recently seen when HBO was taken over by Discovery, that can be trashed in a moment in order to help the profits of the corporation, which got into debt for other reasons. And in that case, it has damaged the thing. That's all, just, just a thought. Okay, um, so, let me just quickly make sure I've said hello to the people of the... Uh, so, Larry asks, video streaming has existed since the 1990s. No, absolutely not. Television existed since the 1990s. The golden age of television is what um, is being referred to. The fact that streaming has taken over a large hunk of television or screen time or whatever you want to call it, um, the golden age of of, of <laughs> stuff on home screens, which used to be called television, now, who knows what it's called? Um, so the answer is no. The 1990s uh, video streaming did not exist. Video streaming has only existed 
uh, the past 10 years, I think. I don't know. Not sure. It's certainly in a in a uh, functional way. Most people have not been streaming more than that. Uh, thank you, Anshul. That's very nice. Hi, Michael. Um, and hello, Jovanic 3 d from Slovenia. Nice to see you there. Okay. Um, sounds like the medium is the message. You mean the the brand? Because certainly I'm not saying the medium is the message. I'm saying the, the message is the message. <laughs> That's my whole point. Um, that the content actually is the purpose of a broadcast network. <laughs> that the purpose of a network is not to to make a lot of money at whatever means possible. In other words, if the network could make more money by becoming a travel agency, that's not a good network. It may be a good company, but it's a terrible TV network. Um, and uh, so that that my point is that at a certain point, we have to value the thing you're doing at some level beyond simply being a good company. Otherwise, everyone would be in, in AI. Okay. Um, Ford versus Ford Motors. Larry says, my mind immediately goes to Ford versus Ford Motors investors. I don't know what that is, but I can guess that there was a, a lawsuit in which the, the, the investors were trying to change or take over the company and Ford fought back. I don't know, but um, it certainly sounds like that. Um, and there is there's a serious problem now. I mean, this, is, this, is, this is, goes way beyond uh, writing. And I do want to distinguish we can't control or change um, the the system of, of of how business and society is run, except in our own individual work. And that's where I do believe it is important. Obviously, you're going to have to work for the people who have the money, and the people who have the money are going to make the rules for how you work for them. That is a fact. Um, but as we have often seen, the people who make the rules for how things make money are almost entirely wrong about how the arts work and what will be successful. Um, okay, Hyperab says, but isn't profitability supposed to be a consequence of how much people like a work of art? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, because people may love a work of art um, at, at the scale that they see it, in a certain town, for instance, but unless it is broadcast through a uh, profitable machine business, um, which like right now we are being steered by algorithms, which means if the algorithm suppresses your particular video or simply doesn't promote your video, um, then you will not become profitable. You cannot. Be, cannot. Um, you can make the greatest movie in the world, and if it only gets shown hand to you know by hand crank projectors in individual theaters, you are not going to be able to. Well, you may be able to become profitable. You won't become big business. Um, depending on the cost of your um, project, yes, you can become profitable. Um, but to simply say profitability equals quality, profitability equals likability, is untrue. Um, because there are, there are thumbs on the scale, as people say. There are things being steered. For example, for most of the past few centuries, authors of color, um, women authors, were excluded from much of publishing in certainly the United States. And therefore, um, you could say, well, if people liked it, then they'd sell more. But if they're not being chosen to publish, they can't be liking it and they can't. Also, depending on how they market it will depend on whether or not it's popular. Because also, profitable and popular are very, very different. You can go broke with the number one hit. <laughs> um, and, and very often, company, like, okay, HBO was the number one network in almost every way, you know, in terms of, of quality and respect and everything else. Um, they were bought by a, a, another network which was, went into debt, and therefore HBO is broke but doing the most expensive and best work, highest quality. Hard to, and by the way, I'm not saying HBO is the only thing, just an example. Um, okay, but, but I do think it's important. People are equating, especially, and, and I, I wanna keep steering this back to writing um, or, or being an artist. People in the arts business, in the arts education business particularly, keep steering this conversation back to if you are making a living, if you are making a hit, 
If you are popular, you must be good. And if you are not doing that, you must not. The reason is you were not good enough. Your quality was not there. And that is simply not true. Um, there are many, many other factors involved. Okay. When writers and other artists, hi Ricky, are expected to become a brand, capitalism threatens culture. Yes. Um, I mean, there will be some people who will argue that that's, that's what culture should be. Um, <laughs> but yes, this is a problem. Um, and it's tricky because there is an instinctive, natural, for instance, Monet, the painter, um, or Stephen King, uh, the author. They were not necessarily operating as in, oh, I want to be a brand. They had an artistic taste which was identifiable and pleasing to the public, and then it got marketed as a brand. Um, interestingly, Stephen King, I was just reading a book about the history of American novels and publishing. Uh, it's called, ah, damn, I can't remember, Big Fiction. The book is called Big Fiction. Um, and and it's um, one of the things it talks about is um, the period at which Stephen King became big, and Stephen King is a remarkable author. He's very prolific, very entertaining. He can be pretty sloppy, but he's just terrific in many ways. Uh, but he also coincided with the moment at which publishing companies were being taken over by corporations who required more profit, um, whereas before that, the publishing companies were more mom and pop shops, which would say, hey, we want to publish X, Y, and Z, and we'll take the smaller profit to have the identity we have. Um, and also mainly chain stores. Um, for the first time, chain bookstores were becoming big. And therefore, if they put it in their window or display, it would change the, the um, fate of a book or an author. Anyway, um, so the point is, yes, branding... Branding is a part of art. We like Dickens and Shakespeare partly because we recognize their style and we glom onto it. We want more of it. However, at the same time, um, branding as a um, uh, as a a thing which excludes anything except the brand is indeed a threat to culture. I agree with you, Ricky. Absolutely. Um, Paradoxically, yes, uh, wealth has always supported, historically supported art. Yes, this is the other thing I want to mention. Um, you may want to do a form of art which cannot compete financially. You know, you may want to do an opera with just a flute, okay? <laughs> flute and voice. Um, if you want to do that, you may not be able to do that without patronage. Patronage is when somebody says, I like this form of art. Um, or this p work of art, enough for me to put money into it, even though I may even lose that money. That's patronage. And that is very important because not everything can make money. Um, so sometimes it's an individual patron. Somebody will say, you know what? I like jazz. And jazz is, there are people who are doing jazz who cannot make a living. I will simply create a foundation to give them money. Cool. Cool. Or the government. Uh, many, many governments will say, we are going to support the arts. Yay, government support of the arts. Um, and, and in doing so, obviously, there is going to be a... Uh, there are going to be choices made based on values. And some of those values may not be ones we agree with or not. But the point is that patronage is happening. And that is part of it. That's what government grants or foundation grants or whatever, or, or collecting a bunch of people to film, uh, fund your independent film, even though it will lose money. That's what it's about. Um, and that's a real thing. Okay. Um, have you ever heard of Legion M Entertainment? It's crowdfunded. No, I have not. Legion M. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I believe there will be continuing forms of support for artists and support for art. And some of them will be profitable. Some of them will be scams. And some of them will be ways that business people are trying to figure out a way to essentially make the Uber of art in which they take a lot of money and the artists get none. Um, all of these things are possible. It, we should be open to all of them. But you should also be cautious um, w whether or not you're dealing with patronage or exploitation. That's just something to thought. Um, 
understanding that we all try to make art that makes sense to us, but also try to make it make sense to please others. Yes, yeah, that's that is the other thing. Not uh, art is is not universal. I often say so. Therefore, um, yeah, there's going to be different forms of art. Some forms of art are going to be more popular than others, but much of that popularity is dependent on um, mass ex, uh, mass distribution. For instance, uh, there was a period in which in order to become a big hit record, you had to be on top 40 radio, 40 slots, <laughs> the top 40 records of the week. Um, and there was, in fact, sometimes often, sometimes often, there was sometimes bribery or cronyism or just uh, a, a, a group of people following their instincts, um, which is actually legit, um, would steer top 40 away from very cool other music. Um, that's part of the arts, um, which is the other reason I really emphasize how much arts is not a business. Um, there are the, the thing to remember is that therefore you may want to try your art form in a way that you can make it profitable because you can. You just have to lower the cost and lower your expectations of income. Or, you know, I know of a bookstore that is a, a part of a cafe. The cafe makes the money and the bookstore sells the books and does not make as much money, but the cafe keeps the bookstore going. Cool. Hi, T. Trent. Um, as Darian says, as Neil Gaiman says, and I agree with almost everything Neil Gaiman says ever, Neil Gaiman is a great uh, artist, but also a great speaker on art. Um, a great pontificator on the subject. And he says, just make good art. And to a certain extent, that is true. Um, his, his point is, the art has to come first. The good art has to come first. You can't say, what do people want? I will do that. Unless that happens to match with your good art, it's not going to help. Um, and there's an awful lot of crappy art out there because of this. Um, what is my favorite movie? New topic. Uh, I'm sure we'll go back to the other one. Um, here's the thing about my favorite movie. My favorite movie is a list of about 500 movies. <laughs> uh, I remember when the AFI, uh, the American Film Institute, started putting out a list of the 100 most important American films. I remember thinking, this just barely scratches the surface of my favorites. <laughs> um, and there were obviously some that weren't my favorite on there. Um, I cannot possibly pick a favorite anything. I can't pick a favorite color. I can't pick a favorite food. Um, my goal in life, and you can see from looking at my office behind me, is to have as much stuff uh, available at, as possible at all times, which is why the digital age is great for me personally. Um, I, there are so many I like. I have done some live streams where I talked about ones that influenced me. Um, I would like to, if I had the, the mental space, um, I'm just going to put a link to that live stream um, in the description. Um, after this is done, look in the description about 10 minutes later. You'll see a link. We'll go to that live stream. Uh, the answer is I have so many favorites and they're constantly changing and being added to and subtracted from. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I failed you. <laughs> I cannot answer uh, even even what's your top 10. You know, even top 100, really. Back to Ford versus Ford Motors. Ford wanted to give his employees a raise, but the court side with the investors. So, and oh my gosh, that is, that is not good. <laughs> I just want to say it. Uh, I know I'm taking a stand here. It's politics a bit. Um, but, but no, no, investing was not originally invented in order to just make more money for the investors, it was to make the thing. I, I got to do it again. All right. Do the thing. If, if you if you get investors for your car company, it's because you want to make cars <laughs> and the investors should be into that. They should say, we think this is going to make us some money, but we want if the choice becomes we make more money or you make better cars, it should be the cars. Um, OK. Hello, Najo. Good to see you. Um, 
Did golf and Western influence the motion picture product? To a certain extent, yes. Um, more later, um, the, the, the first wave of corporate takeovers in the 70s led to the movies of the 80s, which were more popular um, and, and more successful in many ways. I got to say, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not one of those people who over romanticizes the movies of the 1970s, which were very um, artistically ambitious, but often really unwatchable. <laughs> Um, but anyway, the answer is yes. Um, corporate takeover of the movie companies did alter the production and content of movies. Um, there have been many, many books on that topic um, and documentaries and people uh, uh, ranting like me. Thanks, Hyperabs. And, and please, you know, argue with me. I may, you know, first of all, I'm not saying I, uh, th this is the only truth. Um, and and there, is, there are arguments against what I am saying. Um, the thing that's bothering me is that the argument for the profit motive above all others, I'll fight, I'll f that's a hill I may die on. <laughs> um, and yet, I believe that there should be a, I, I'm actually a, uh, I believe that capitalism, when properly regulated, and, and more than properly regulated, regulation would come from the public the people, the world, saying, we have other values. You can't do that. <laughs> That's my point. Okay. Nowadays, every movie targeted at a younger audience has to have a feministic message without really exploring the topic. Yes, yeah, the girl bosses. Uh, I got to tell you, that is, this is a problem. Uh, the, the, one of the most embarrassing things that happens in all arts at all times is some trend will become um, vital. In other words, the decision makers on who whose art gets put before the public will be like, we need to do X, Y, and Z. It could be we need to shock the bourgeoisie or it may be we need to support the church. Whatever it was, at any given time, there are th messages. And pretty soon those messages become cringy and obvious and unthought out. Um, and so therefore, right now, yes, um, there are certain messages, one of which is is trying to empower women, which is often done by simply shallowly imitating whatever used to empower men. <laughs> um, and that's that's pain, that's painful, that's bad. Um, yes, once again, um, you wanna do the thing. Admittedly, some people may say, that's the value I wanna do. I wanna, I, I believe in that, I will put my art into this cliched thought. They have that right. I would never say they sh that bad art shouldn't exist um, or that that's not bad art. Fair argument. Um, if argument, uh, if if the point of art, of, of a work of art is to convey a message, cool. I'm okay with that. Um, okay, money comes with conditions. That is almost always true. Now and then, and almost all good art has come from this situation, for whatever reason, the artist was given a little more room to move. You know, Citizen Kane came because RKO said, yeah, you can do whatever you want as long as you stay within this budget. Um, Woody Allen's movies were famously done on, the, and I'm sorry, I, yes, he is a problematic and, and possibly criminal person. However, his artwork at the time in the 70s and 80s was created because he um, arranged a deal in which no one had any say over the content as long as he stayed within budget and got a certain number of names in the cast. Um, uh, w once again, I, I've told these stories before, but um, the USA Network was was desperate um, to to get series going um, for a more HBO-esque audience, and so they um, supported an artist like Sam Esmail um, to do Mr. Robot, uh, which ordinarily the conditions would be, no, you can't do that. <laughs> and and there was a space that opened up. Or sometimes you get something like, uh, you know, A24 or, or Annapurna, companies where a certain person with a lot of money will say, you know what, I'm going to support artists I believe in, and that may, that may mean limiting my conditions. Um, I'm not taking attendance here, folks. It's okay if you're late. It's okay if you miss it and watch it later. It's okay if you never watch it at all. Don't tell YouTube I said that, but it is. Um, okay, but hi, Hasco. <laughs> it's good to see you. Um, 
Yay! C congratulations. Donna is working on a very complicated time-shifting script and is, is getting things done. Um, writing cinema takes years. I love doing it, but it's also a big challenge. This is completely true. I am not saying any of this is easy. <laughs> um, yes. The, the, oh, cool. Um, yeah, and what's more, I think cafes with bookstores or, or gyms with bookstores or whatever else, you know, why not? There's there's no no reason why not. Sadly, our local bookstore cafe closed a big brand competition. Ouch! Okay. Okay. Ouch. Not good. But yes, it happens. It happens. Uh, all sorts of factors are involved. Um, okay. Bit off topic uh, and trivia, but are you familiar with Alice Guy? I am not. Um, not at all. Okay. What's a movie you've outgrown? Loved originally, but reassessed it later in life. Um, I, I've talked about this before. There was a movie called Trouble in Mind. Um, Trouble in Mind is, is and, I, and I still have affection for it personally, but I cannot recommend it professionally in many ways. Some ways I still can. Um, Trouble in Mind. It was, it was written and directed by a guy named Alan Rudolph. Um, had a terrific cast at the time. There are certain scenes that are really great. The production design is amazing. The score is phenomenal. Um, but it has not held up like the, it was magical when it came out, and, um, and it does, does not hold up that well. Um, however, I still have affection for it. Um, okay. Did distribution feel weary about the message, well, wary uh, about the message? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, those are actually two examples <laughs> where um, someone, um, someone uh, had an in um, to, to push away the conditions um, which what was thought to be commercially popular um, would... Uh, David Fincher had enough power after Seven to fight... There's, I'll tell it another time too, but David Fincher famously told the story that there was a book that he liked called Fight Club, and he saw the movie, and like he saw that it could be a movie. He um, arranged to have a script written. Because the rules of Hollywood are you can't do voiceover, and the novel is written in the first person, um, the original script apparently came in without voiceover. It was just telling the story of the Fight Club. Um, and it did. It, he was just like, this is garbage. This is terrible. And the, the writer was like, I, I had to. We're not allowed to use voiceover. And David was just like, do it again. Use voiceover. And of course, the voiceover is crucial to the success of Fight Club, not just in terms of, of um, cool filmmaking, but in terms of understanding the character and the story. The very, very essential center of Fight Club requires there to be a dissonance between the voice and the visuals, and that the understanding of what they call an unreliable narrator, in other words, that even though this person is talking to you directly, does not mean they own the truth or everything they say should be believed. And the development of that is, is central to Fight Club. So not having voiceover would make it nearly impossible. Um, but it required somebody who had the place to say, I am going to push back on the conventions in order to do what I believe will be right with this. And let's remember Fight Club was a flop when it came out <laughs> for various reasons, and it slowly developed its legendary and I believe well-deserved re um, reputation, um, but it was not a success when it first came out. Um, I believe it required DVD sales to become successful. Um, and likewise, Joker, it was simply that they, they said to the, the director, who's, who's um, somewhat notoriously um, <laughs> uh, insistent on his own vision, um, they, they said, look, you can do this movie within our universe. Um, you don't have to follow the user, rules of the universe as long as you <laughs> sort of stay in your lane and stay at your budget and, and do your thing quietly. Um, and of course, that was marvelous. It made for, but the answer was um, that the distributors carved out an area where they felt they could afford to support a, a previously successful artist. And this is important. The way that, unfortunately, the arts business works is that they say the 
the ways that we know how to find success is by doing a thing that was already successful, which is in fact in art, not the proper way to get success. It's the only way that business people know how. So therefore, um, almost always they say, I'm not going to read the temperature of the arts. I'm not going to read the temperature of the society as I see it and bet on that, which is what art does. They say, if this person just had a hit, if, if um, the director of Fight Club just did seven, or if the director of Joker had just done the Hangover trilogy, um, we're going to give him within a, a, a budget range room to do what they do because we don't know what we have to bet on something and either we bet on a gimmick like you know superheroes or capes or car chases or whatever it is that they decided was the cause of something being successful which it never was um they'll bet on that a car chase movie like bullet comes out uh, actually french connection comes out um and then everyone's like we need to do car chase movies and most of them are garbage um, but they thought, oh, that element was successful. So the answer is both, yes. Both Fight Club and Joker were, were breaking a lot of rules. However, um, they did that because the cost was limited, although <laughs> Fight Club, I believe, went over budget. Um, but the, the, um, the situation was such that the business people said, within this boundary, you can do what you want. Likewise, Titanic. Okay, Titanic or Terminator 2. Um, James Cameron is famous for this. James Cameron managed to become very successful with Terminator. He had a hit. And he said, I am now going to ask for more money than anyone has ever asked for to do something bigger than I've ever done. Um, and because they had a hit before, they said, okay, we'll bet on this. And also there was always something commercially like, okay, there's going to be more explosions here than ever. <laughs> there's going to be more aliens than the last alien. Um, anyway, so therefore, um, an artist within a genre um, that they believe in um, often is given room to work um, outside. But that's that's... That's part of the business. And yes, that's how often good stuff happens. <gasps> Sorry, went on a bit about that. Um, okay, Woody is not a criminal for you. you yeah, no, I actually, very complicated question. Um, and in fact, there's there's been some good writing on this topic recently, essays and books, not recently, but in the past five years or so. Um, what do we do with art by people who we find possibly reprehensible or criminal and yet the work of art they did is good. My personal answer is um, that if you are, if there is a question of supporting an ongoing wrong, then you should withdraw your support. In other words, if, <laughs> if the production of Rust was still going on, well, it is still going on, but if, if, if you could buy a ticket to Rust, and that was going to mean that they were going to be making five more Rusts the way they make Rust. Rust was the Western um, in which uh, poor management allowed um, the cinematographer to be shot dead um, by a prop gun. Or not a prop gun, that's the point. Um, the answer to that is there were failures of the producing of that movie. Um, and so therefore, that sh those people who did that should not be supported in making more movies, okay? Um, likewise, if a person is found to be um, badly behaved or even criminal in their activities while they make successful art, yes, you should probably not buy tickets to their next movie so as not to support that behavior. That behavior, frankly, as far as I'm concerned, should be punished for the behavior, not for the art. Unfortunately, the art may be good. Um, what you have to do is have a company that says, I'm sorry, director, you may not hit your actors. Um, even if you are James, uh, not saying James Cameron, even if you have the number one film, you can't hit your actors. Um, that's my thought, is that on the other hand, to look back on work of art that was done in the 1920s or 1950s or 1970s and say, I can't look at, I can't watch that because I don't want to support 
the behavior of the people or the beliefs of the people who did that, I'm not sure that there's a value in that. Um, uh, I understand it. I also understand not wanting if the contents are objectionable. But what I'm saying is sometimes the contents are great and the person who made it is bad. Uh, that is my take on Woody. Um, I truly love Woody Allen's artwork, at least up through Stardust Memories, um, and maybe a couple after that. The initial period of his career was extremely important to American film history and cultural history. Um, he did what I consider great work. However, as time has gone on, we have seen and learned about his behavior in such a way that, yeah, I'm not, I, I don't know uh, that he should be supported for that. But I'm not going to say don't watch Annie Hall, because I think Annie Hall is a worthwhile piece of art. Um, okay. How to get that guy. Ah, yes. Okay. The question of how to get the leeway that they give to artists who have succeeded to do your thing. The answer is work within your means. If all you can do is, you know, a, a play in your barn, do that. But do the best work you can. As Neil Gaiman said, make good art. As I have said, do the thing. If you can do that thing by making a zine where you Xerox your comics and hand them out and sell them in little bookshops in your neighborhood, do that. Um, will you necessarily succeed? No. But but without doing that, you're honestly the the chances are frankly zero, and, and they should be because you have to do the work, do the thing, <laughs> do the thing. And if all you can do is do the thing by handwriting your poetry and selling it one at a time, do that. Um, then, ideally, you know, some big publishing whiz will find it and say, oh, this is good. I'm going to support that because I can afford a little room there. But the, there's no way that you get to do that if you don't have the thing, if you don't have the art. So work on the art. That is my goal. That is my message. Work on you and your art and figuring out your way to inch forward in whatever spaces you can find. Those will be different for everyone. There are people who are children of Hollywood moguls who can make a movie. <laughs> they can just do it. They can call in favors and get it. They have an advantage, yes. However, many of those will be bad, just like many of everybody's will be bad. Uh, it's not the defining factor. The defining factor is the thing itself, the work itself. Do the thing. Okay. <sighs> Have you ever thought, hi, Dan, about writing a book, about writing a screenplay? Meaning about writing a book about writing a screenplay, not writing a book or writing a screenplay, because I have written screenplays. The answer is yes. Down the line, I would like to take the contents of all my videos and make them into a book, um, because I think it would be a different form of book than most screenwriting books are. Uh, most screenwriting books are essentially sort of written down lectures or workbooks. Um, I want mine to be more like a kind of flip book of inspiration <laughs> where you can just it's no you can look at it like with the videos in no particular order and it's mainly bold statements that you just sort of process and then go and do your own thing from so that's my goal is to actually take the videos and make a book out of them however i got to write my novel first so i am working on that when the novel is done i seriously will try to do the book okay didn't help Michael Cimino. You know, Michael Cimino didn't help Michael Cimino. It actually did help Michael Cimino because the truth is, on the success of Deer Hunter, he got to do Heaven's Gate. The fact that Heaven's Gate went way out of control, and it it did. <laughs> it's it's I I kind of think it's interesting, but it's it's artistically challenging in many ways. Also good in many ways. The point to okay for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about. In the 1970s, there was a young filmmaker named Michael Cimino who um, worked his way up through the business, did an action movie called Thunderbolt and Lightfoot, which was actually pretty cool. Um, and then he got the chance to do a movie called The Deer Hunter, which was sprawling and artsy and and fabulous. Um, it's it's 
are actually artistically, as far as its understanding of the Vietnam War, simplistic and and um, kind of monstrous. However, its understanding about the people on the American side of the story is fabulous. Um, but once again, still simplified. It's just great filmmaking. So this movie, The Deer Hunter, won tons of awards. Everyone in the cast just got huge boosts. Uh, Michael Cimino could make whatever he wanted. And he, what he wanted to do was this Western called Heaven's Gate, which at the time was the most expensive movie made, except for maybe Cleopatra and Gone with the Wind. There were a couple others that actually did better. The point is, it was huge. <laughs> Let's just talk about what a huge budget was at the time. I believe it was $35 million, which is really funny because that's a low budget now. And I'm not talking about inflation. I'm talking about the way things have changed. Um, anyway, Heaven's Gate, there is a book. Um, uh, damn, what's the call? There's, there's a book about this by, written by one of the, um, one of the authors, Stephen Bach, S-T-E-V-E-N, Bach, B-A-C-H. I can't remember the title. Oh, Final Cut. It's called Final Cut. Um, I believe it's called Final Cut by Stephen Bach. It's an amazing book uh, detailing what happened on the colossal disaster of the movie Heaven's Gate, which um, basically brought down United Artists Studio. United Artists was the classiest studio of its time. It was the A24 of its time. It started because three, art United Artists, started because three or four artists, Charlie Chaplin, uh, Mary Pickford, uh, uh, I can't believe I can't remember his husband. Anyway, uh, Fairbanks, uh, John uh, Fairbanks, um, Ronald Fairbanks, Justin Fairbanks. I, anyway, Fairbanks, Pickford, Chaplin, they got together. I think Griffith uh, said, let's make a company because we're the talent. Let's make a company that supports talent. It started in the 20s. It lasted all the way through into the 80s. It made a lot of great movies and supported a lot of great artists. And then they gambled on um, on Heaven's Gate at the moment that they had been taken over by a big uh, company, a big corporation that I believe uh, did insurance and parking lots. Anyway, uh, this book, Final Cut by Stephen Bach, is an amazing study of Hollywood at that moment when big conglomerates were taking over movie studios. Anyway, the answer is... Michael Cimino's film was a disaster. It was three hours long. They cut it, cut an hour out of it, um, and it would be, became that's that's uh, it became the 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 movie to define artistically pretentious, overwrought, overpriced, um, disastrous movies. Heaven's Gate. Um, it's actually an interesting movie. It's got good sequences and it's got some boring crap that goes way too long. Uh, anyway. Um, the point is, I don't believe that Michael Cimino, um, Michael Cimino had his shot because of his power, because of his last hit. And he, I got to say, more than anyone else, he was responsible for his own uh, downfall in that, in that case. What do you think about the fact that the quality of art is deteriorated because the most spectacular and not necessarily most valuable is most demanded? Okay, here's the thing about that. I can't fully back that one. I can't say that the quality of all art has deteriorated because there's lots of different art. Um, the quality of the most public art, and honestly, this has been a, a, a criticism of art since the beginning of art. <laughs> there, you know, back when novels were, were coming out, people were saying, oh, those crappy popular novels are ruining the great poetry before. And, and um, when movies came out, all of movies were considered spectacular crap. Um, I can't completely agree. What I can agree with is, um, is that what's happened is the business has less room for variation. This is a problem of profitability, competition, business mentality, corporate mentality. Um, and I will, I will um, mention on this topic... I've done a video called Contest versus Library. I would urge you to watch this. Um, it is a philosophical approach to art. Here's the thing. Um, 
there will be a link, by the way, to that in, in the description when I get done, which will be very shortly. Um, I do, if, if a corporation says we should put $200 million into one movie um, because that will make, because $200 million movies are more likely to be successful, instead of doing a whole bunch of $20 million movies or $1 million movies, they have destroyed a large category of other movies while betting on the big one. Um, or um, they will simply say, we want everything to make, a, to make a certain amount of profit. And therefore, if something is artistically interesting, but not pr that profitable, we will remove it because we want to optimize our business. That is detrimental to the art business. They shouldn't be in the art business. That's part of the art business. Um, that is, once again, something I do strongly feel um, has, has damaged the world of art. But it comes back to the idea that, that optimizing your business and being in the business of doing the thing of art, once again, I'm going to get to do the thing, um, <laughs> are um, at odds and that you have to make a choice. Um, what can, the question is, what can we do about it? I believe a couple of things. One, have this conversation. <laughs> if every time you talk about this topic, you say, you know, it, not, having the number one hit is not the only value. A lot of you out there are already saying this. Um, that's one thing you can do. Um, in theory, support the places that don't do that. Support the smaller companies, support the smaller projects, support you know, the, 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 the stuff by buying them, by, by paying the rental for them, by buying a ticket to them, those that in theory would help. I don't know if it'll help enough because we've, the inequality has, has t tipped over into um, a revolving uh, snowball of big over small. And I, I, I believe <laughs> a, a, a a movement in general against the idea of what I'm calling the religion of business, the idea of seeing profit and optimizing as the core human value that all other values should be guided through. I believe taking a stand against that would be good. I do not believe that we should, you know, overthrow Time Warner. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I don't know that we have that much power, um, honestly. Uh, can we reverse it? The way that we can reverse it is by um, by going to the smaller thing, seeing the smaller thing, doing the smaller thing, and living with it. That's all I can say about that. I mean, I don't, I don't have a an actual you know revolutionary program by which the arts companies are going to be taken over by a by a commission overseen by me, which really is the solution, if you think about it. If I was put in charge of all arts production in America, I guarantee you this would not be a problem. There you go. Vote for me. Um, by the way, that was sarcasm. That was a joke. <laughs> I don't want that job. I mean, I, I would love that job, but I, I wouldn't take it. If the artist is doing something wrong within the process of creating the artwork, then you are supporting it, yes. However, if the wrongdoing is in their personal life, it should never interfere with your appreciation of the work itself. Yeah, Alex, I, I think we're saying the same thing, although it, it is tricky. Um, it's like if, if you had a, your local store, okay, local shop on the corner that you buy bread at, and you buy bread and you find out that the owner of the bread store, and it's really good bread and it's cheap and it's easy for you to get, and that owner has been beating his family. And it's purely personal, happens off duty, but every day goes home from the great bread store and takes a belt to his, his entire family. I would say there is a argument to be made for not buying his bread. Well, first of all, for trying to get him arrested, but second of all, by, for saying, you know what, I gotta give up on the bread. So that it is tricky. Um, Ideally, what happens is that person's behavior takes them like the bread corporation <laughs> that that supports it. Like the, in the case of movie makers, that somebody would say, you know what, person, uh, ideally you give somebody a chance to correct their behavior. 
you, you get to say, okay, see if you can make a movie without having a horrible personal life. But if you keep doing the horrible personal life, we have to take away your movie. That, that's all I can say. Um, the pet rock was covered. Look like. That is true. Pet Rock was very popular and completely, it was, see, the Pet Rock was a comment upon its own sale. Um, hi, Jacob Incognito. Um, and by the way, I'm going to have to call a, a close to comments, um, but but I'm going to do whatever's here. Do you have any, any advice on how to keep the audience engaged in a story in which the protagonist switches halfway through? Um, some. Um, uh, in theory, and, and this would depend, but if the protagonist switches to like an entirely different story, that's just going to be hard to do. <laughs> um, but if you have something like um, spoiler for Psycho, um, in Psycho, um, and I think I've discussed this earlier, um, we start out following Marion at a certain point for various reasons, which I will not spoil. Um, we start to look at some other characters, <laughs> um, and Marion becomes less important to the. The answer is there has to be some through line connecting your your two protagonists or your multiple protagonists, um, in which you want to see the relationship of those two stories and the meaning of that handoff. Um, that's how you handle that. Um, I mean, if you look at it honestly, the way to to look at how to keep the audience engaged in a story where the protagonist switches is look at any ensemble, any good ensemble story. Um, you look at Love Actually, look at Game of Thrones, you look at anything where there's multiple storylines, that's actually what you're doing. You're switching protagonists repeatedly. Um, and the answer is there's either a theme or a story or something that is pulling these elements together in our minds. Even if these people never meet, um, we understand their effect on each other or their effect on our understanding of each other. Um, does that make sense? I hope it does because it's right. <laughs> um, and if not, uh, send me an email or something and I'll further explain. But the answer is, if you have multiple protagonists, either switching during the course of the story or simply ensembling, what you need to do is think about what is the overall thing that the audience is following through these multiple protagonists. Um, I believe that the cause of this problem is the teaching that every story has one protagonist. If you simply didn't teach that, we wouldn't have this problem because you look at lots of stories where there are multiple protagonists or even switching protagonists. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Study the work that does that and you'll see how it's done. Um, in many ways, this belief in the single protagonist as the only important character in a story is very harmful. Because the truth is, even if you have a story with a single clear protagonist, every other character should be given some emotional weight and time, and therefore you're kind of switching protagonists in that sense. Um, the answer is the belief that there is a single protagonist is overrated, the way to not do it is to look at stories which don't do it. Um, I did a, a video called Take Art Apart. Um, I will put a link to that down. Oops, sorry. That was an accident. Uh, I will put a link to that uh, in the description shortly. Um, but um, the answer is look at works that do it. Do some research. Psycho is certainly a good example um, of, of a switching protagonist, but there are others. Um, but the other, the easier thing is look for ensembles and see how an idea or a problem or a situation or a goal or a theme um, pulls the different characters in our minds together. They don't have to actually be pulled together in the story. They have to be pulled together in our mind. For instance, we could follow two stories in which they are having opposite um, adventures and fates. And that will, in our mind, will be like, how am I understanding this connection? And there should be some understanding of what, should, what caused one person's fate to go one way and one person's fate to go the other. That would be a way to do that. Douglas Fairbanks. Thank you, Alexis. Ah, Alex Alexis has saved the day. And Najo. Douglas Fairbanks. Yes, I know. I should have known it. Uh, I got too much stuff up in here. Sometimes it gets it gets uh, 
<laughs> do the thing, a hashtag. I've got a hashtag. Okay. Um, all right. Um, Anshul is defending Woody. I would... Um, okay. I, I, I am not attacking Woody's art, although there are some things that I have problems with. He's also a huge hero of mine. I am not criticizing Woody as an artist. I am criticizing him as a person. In his private life, his behavior towards other people in his life, particularly women, has been documented enough different ways as objectionable that I do feel uncomfortable about not mentioning it. Um, even though artistically he's does some great stuff. Uh, do the thing. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, single protagonist, it's a thing. You can do it. It's You should do it, but it's not the only thing. Um, people are always looking, optimizing. There's one way to do this. Ain't the case. Hi, Javier. Um, good feedback on readers of my project. It looks like, yes, yes. Um, thank you for all your support and, 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 and your many margaritas and other cheerful uh, chimings in. I'm really happy for you that you did that. Everyone. Take Javier's example, finish a piece of work, even if it's small, whatever it is, and show it to people and get feedback. And that feedback will often be frustrating or painful or, or, or just wrong. That's okay. Keep doing it. That is the key. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right. That's it. I'm going to take off. Um, it has been fabulous to talk to you all for today. And the thing I hope you will do is go write something.